Good afternoon, folks, or good morning. Thanks for joining uh, this afternoon, for me, a webinar on layers. And this is a little bit different because we're dividing up uh, the content into two different halves. So we're gonna have part one and part two. Part two will be next week. Uh, the reason for that is essentially layers is really one of the best parts about Capture One and its development has extended over the past uh, few years. Um, to basically mean that squeezing it all of it into one hour would probably be a little bit stressful uh, for you and a bit stressful for me. So it made sense to divide it up. So the purpose today is to talk a little bit about why layers, first of all, why would you want to uh, selectively edit parts of your photo? Um, and we'll look at some of the more basic stuff this week to get you set up for some more advanced things next week. So today is fairly low level, nice and simple, good foundation, and then next week we we'll move on to the other stuff. Okay, so before we do that, those of you on YouTube and Facebook, uh, welcome. Thanks for joining in on the chat as well. I can see lots of messages coming in. Uh, feel free to ask questions there as well. I will see them. Uh, if you're in the webinar room itself, over on my right, which is why I'm looking this way, if you do have a question, uh, pop it into the Q&A tab, and that just means it's a little bit easier for myself to find, or Diego, my fantastic colleague, who's also hanging out in the chat as well. If you need a bit more real estate, uh, then you can also hide uh, that chat as well, and then you'll get Capture One bigger on the screen. So, let us get started. So, as I said, first of all, why layers? Why would we possibly want to use layers in our editing workflow? And what do I mean by layers? Layers essentially allow us to target different areas of the photo for different editing. Now this could be exposure changes, it could be adding more detail, it could be changing the color of a particular area and so on. So targeting your edits to different areas of the picture. So first of all, I'm just gonna give you a very quick example why you can't always solve all of your issues without using layers. Now I've realized that <clears throat> my head is in a rather stupid place, so I'm actually gonna move me up here because we actually wanna talk about uh, this section down in the bottom of the right hand corner. So this is a photo I took um, a few months back with one of our ambassadors, Paul Reefer. It's had some basic editing, not a great deal, uh, but one thing to finish it off, I personally feel that down below me in this area, this is a bit on the dark side and I'd like to open up the shadows a bit. <clears throat> so with most editing, we're gonna try and see what we can solve, you know, just by using basic sliders first, first of all. So if I open up the shadows, so if I drag the shadow slider to the right hand side, what happens? Well, I can kind of see into this area much better than I could before but it's also affected if I just click on the shadow slider. It's also had an effect on the rest of the picture. So shadow slider, no good. What about the black slider? A Little bit more isolated to the lower end, if you like, of the histogram. So if I slowly open up the blacks, then that has a slightly better effect, but it's also changing the density down here in the front, which is not something I want on this picture. So better to figure it out and edit that section all by itself, which by using layers. <clears throat> so, um, sorry, I just thought I had a technical issue, but we're all good. Now the good news is, and, and I'm skipping ahead slightly to a new feature that was added last year in version 21, is something called style brushes, which we're gonna look at a little bit later. But style brushes have made the whole process of working with layers much, much easier. But we're gonna look at it old school first of all, just so you get an idea of uh, the principle. Um, and then you'll see how super simple it is when we're uh, working with style brushes as well. So how do we work selectively on our photo? Well, we have to tell Capture One, I want to edit this part, this part, this part separately. And how do we do that? By creating a layer and targeting on that layer or, or drawing a mask which tells Capture One, restrict my edits to this particular section. And we have lots of different ways to draw masks, essentially. Um, <clears throat> so I was just checking that we might have had a Facebook issue, but it seems to be okay. If anyone's on Facebook and they can't see anything, just refresh or go over to YouTube. Uh, and then YouTube, uh, you tend to find the qualities better anyway. 
So we have lots of different ways of drawing masks in Capture One. We can use a brush, we can use something called a magic brush, uh, we have linear gradients, we have radial gradients, all kinds of different ways that really have, you know, the same end result of creating a mask in Capture One. So we're going to go through look and look at those uh, different ways how we can uh, create different masks. Okay, so enter the layers tool and let's think about how we would solve this problem. So along the bottom of the layers tool, we have different cursor tools, which give us different ways of drawing masks. So let's look at the first one. So I'm going to grab a brush. Just going to make it a bit bigger for a second. So if we look at the uh, cursor tool, normally I'm on the pan cursor tool. If I press B to switch to my brush, you can see it looks a bit different. Now we've got two concentric circles. Why is that? Uh, this basically describes the mask that I'm going to draw. So let's very quickly draw a quick mask. Let's say up here we've got controls to actually see the mask when we actually draw it. So let's just uh, draw on my picture and we're going to draw a mask across here. Uh, like so. So now if I hide the mask by pressing M and let's just play with something like exposure, you know, very basic principle. Now that adjustment is only affecting adjustment layer one. Simple. Hopefully you understand that. Now let's do it properly down here. So I'm going to draw a mask on this area. Uh, right clicking changes my brush settings and I'm only going to talk about the first two for now, size and hardness. So how big your brush is and how soft the edges are. Are the edges very soft or are there no soft edges? So right clicking with that brush cursor tool up will give you access to the brush settings. So let's go and brush over here on this side of the rock and essentially what I'm going to do is just kind of fill in this area rather crudely and there's a reason for that you'll see in a minute. So I'm saying, hey Capture One, let's target those adjustments over to that area. And again, uh, pressing M hides the mask on the keyboard. Hides the mask, sorry, <laughs> pressing M on the keyboard hides the mask. So now if I grab my uh, shadow slider and raise that up like so, it's only going to affect that area. Great. Kind of great. Because if we zoom in, doesn't look altogether convincing around the edge here like so. Because if I press M on my keyboard, you can see my mask has bled over the edges a bit. And the reason I've done this is to show you or introduce you to another adjustment on the mask, which makes mask drawing so much better, more natural looking and so on. And what I find is that um, when people start using layers and drawing masks, is that the first I guess impression or the first thing that you feel that you need to do is to be very accurate. So you might be asking, why didn't I cut, you know, perfectly around this rock if I just wanted to brighten this area? One, that can be time consuming and two, often very accurate masks don't look very natural. So how can we go about improving this? Now you'll notice when I started uh, brushing, Capture One created adjustment layer one for me. It's called layer one because we can have up to 16. But this has got a pretty, you know, rubbish um, mask on it, if you like. Uh, so how can we improve that? So first of all, let's get rid of this mask. I'm going to right click and say clear mask like so. So that's going to get rid of my mask, but it's still got my shadow tweak under there if you like. So let's grab my brush, go back over here, right click and look at these two other adjustments, opacity and flow. These two adjustments are super, super crucial to making, you know, very good effective masks that look natural. Basically, you want someone to look at your photo and not think, oh, this guy's done a load of crappy masking. It looks, you know, awful. So you want people for it to look uh, natural and good and so on. So uh, what we're going to do is we are first going to introduce you to the flow control down here, like so. So what flow does is really control how much of the adjustment is painted. You can think of it of painting if you like, if that helps to imagine what's what's going on how much of that adjustment is painted in each brush stroke. Now I'm using a, a pen on a tablet, but you don't have to. Um, same goes for a mouse, exactly the same principle. 
So if I have flow set to 100, as soon as I brush onto my photo, it's gonna put all of my adjustment down on that layer. So all of my shadow adjustment here. So if I, you know, just do a quick brush like so, um, we've got, um, you know, the entire adjustment laid down in one hit, which again, doesn't look very natural. So let's right click and clear that mask. Let's right click once more and we're gonna pull that flow right down. So let's take it to under five. Now what that essentially will do is limit how much of that adjustment is laid down in each brush stroke. So 4% each time. So it allows me to build up that adjustment nice and slowly and then stop when I think it looks good. <clears throat> so if we go for uh, brushing back and forth with a nice low flow, you can see it builds up really, really slowly. And if I brush more heavily in one spot, that's going to open it up more, brighten it more than another spot. And now I've just painted a little bit of, you know, lightness into that area, which looks a lot more natural than it did before. And skipping ahead to next week a little bit, I'm just gonna show you this thing called Grayscale Mask. So what Grayscale Mask does, and if you turn it on accidentally, you won't have any idea what's, what's happening. <coughs> um, but Grayscale Mask represents the mask in levels of gray. It hides the photo and you can only see the mask. So you can see here that my mask is, you know, varying in density. So it's allowing that adjustment of 92 on the shadows to blend in through in various different amounts. Um, if we had flow right up at 100, as soon as I start brushing, you can see we've got the maximum adjustment. If I turn flow down to something low and I start brushing, you see it takes lots and lots of brush strokes uh, to build up uh, that final adjustment. So you can also think of it as um, painting a wall. If you dip your paintbrush into your paint and get it really, really wet, and go straight to the wall and start painting, you have a lot of paint on the wall. If you dip your brush in the tin of paint and you wipe wipe it on the edges and do a really good of drying, of drying it off, when you start painting, you're gonna have much le less paint. So flow is really adjusting how much mask is flowing off the brush, if you like. So let's grab my eraser, that's this one on the end, and uh, bump up the flow and then let's just uh, get rid of our kind of sucky mask over there, essentially. M on the keyboard, and that just gets us back. <clears throat> now you might think, woof, that was a lot of effort for just brightening up a simple corner, but that was a lengthier explanation and you're gonna see how much faster and better it is when you start using style brushes as well. But it's important to know um, the mechanics behind that. Let's pause for a question or two. Uh, can you change the shape of the brush? No, it can be circular uh, only. But Martin, as we go through, you'll see different ways to create a mask, magic brush in a second, uh, which it doesn't really rely on any shape. And next week, you'll see other methods of creating a mask from uh, color selection or luminosity range, which doesn't rely on a brush at all. Uh, let's check questions over here. Um, mm, saturation mask, Leon was asking. That's a, that's a good question. Can I possibly uh, enable a saturation mask? No, you can't. You can, you could in a way, come back next week, Leon, because we're looking at creating masks with the, the color editor, but you couldn't just define a saturation range for the entire picture. You could define a saturation range for a color and do it that way. So we'll look at that next week as well. Okay, so magic brush, we're gonna switch photos. We're gonna go to this lovely photo from my buddy Farzan. Um, this picture, it's got some minor editing, looks great out of camera. Our mountainscape in the background, oh, let's move me back out the way now. Let's go back down here, there we go. Um, the mountain range in the background, it's a bit hazy, it's maybe a little bit cold, so it'd be nice to treat that in a different way. So you've got a few choices. Thinking about what you know so far, you could think, well, I'm gonna grab my brush and then I'm gonna kind of draw around this area. But we've got loads of you know, difficult things that we want to mask around. Um, if I was gonna change the white balance, I would actually want to be fairly accurate now 
because otherwise I'm going to have white balance edits spilling over onto the roof and, and so on. But drawing that by hand would be really annoying. Um, so why not use our magic brush? So magic brush looks slightly different. If I right click, that brings up those magic brush settings. So we still have size and opacity. What I didn't mention with opacity is that that just controls the maximum opacity of your mask. So if we set the opacity to 50%, your mask would never get beyond 50%. So if you had like a one stop uh, exposure change on a layer, you would only ever get 50% of that. So the opacity limits the maximum mask that you can brush in. Tolerance for the magic brush and you'll see how the magic brush works in a minute, really describes how much of neighboring pixels it's gonna pick up automatically. So before we talk any further, let's show you what the magic brush does. So I'm just gonna make it a little bigger. So I wanna mask out this mountain range. So all I'm gonna do is draw a little squiggle in the middle, like so. You'll see in a second a window pop up that says calculating magic brush mask. This is a 100 megapixel shot, so it takes a bit longer. And Capture One then goes ahead and masks. Now it's additive, so we've got some gaps. So I just need to fill in the sky, fill in the mountains, like so. And now we've got a pretty nice mask which wraps around my building quite effectively. Now the other control in here, if we just pick up Magic Brush once more and look at uh, Refine Edge, that's really how much or how brutal the edge. So when the magic uh, brush finds the edge, does it stop dead or does it have like a, a gentle kind of wrap around it? Um, just enough to make it again, not too obvious. So refine edge, let's see if we can see it on the grayscale mask. So if we display our grayscale mask, that's the mask that we've created in white. And if you look on the edge, so you see we've just got a little bit of roll off onto it so it's not too harsh essentially. So now what I can easily do is I'm gonna add a bit more white balance just to warm that up. I'm gonna add some clarity and maybe a tad of contrast and maybe darken it down a bit as well. You get the idea. So to create that kind of mask would have been very difficult. Now there's a couple of other little holes in here. So if we grab our magic brush and make that much smaller, I'm gonna pull the tolerance down because I don't want it to start bleeding off anywhere, anywhere else. So if I just brush in here, like so, then we can fill in those gaps, essentially, like so, where I've played around with my white balance. And that's way, way quicker than, of course, us poor souls having to either do that by hand um, or use something called the auto mask, which I actually don't bother talking about anymore. So if we grab this brush tool, we've actually got something called an auto mask, which is like a crude magic brush, if you like. But now you've got the magic brush, there's much, much less use for that. So that's, it's doing the same thing, the magic brush. It's creating a mask, but instead of drawing it by hand, uh, it's, you know, doing it in a much more intelligent way. So don't forget you can use that as well. It's not restricted to color or exposure or anything like that. It's looking at pixel values. So remember I did that little squiggle in the middle of the screen, first of all. So that area that I've identified, Capture One looks at the surrounding pixels and then decides, okay, this is a near neighbor based on the tolerance, let's mask that in as well. But very, very simple to use. So drawing masks, magic brush, now we've got linear and radial. So let's switch to a different picture. And um, first of all, let's look at uh, linear. Uh, we could actually, let's go for the same picture. So let's call this layer magic brush. Magic brush, like so. And let's make another layer and we're gonna call this uh, linear, like so. So you can disable any layer at any point. So we can uncheck it like so, so you can see what I've done. If when you're turning it on and off, you think, oh, I've overdone that a bit, and I actually think I have overdone that a bit, rather than going back and fiddling with your adjustments, you can actually vary the opacity of each layer on a slider here. So if we rack this opacity back, that's with no adjustments, and that's with all of the adjustments. But if you think there's a good happy medium, then you can roll that opacity slider back. That's a super powerful feature of working with layers. 
because not every layer is going to have one single adjustment that's easy to adjust. So if you think on this layer, I changed the white balance, we added some contrast, we added some clarity. Uh, so to adjust or lessen off all of those is a bit you know, time consuming. So having the ability to just play with the opacity is really, really nice. And you can balance out your adjustments superbly by using that tool. So let's turn Magic Brush off so we're back to normal. Typically, before Magic Brush came along and we looked at a scene like this, we might think, okay, um, I need to have some kind of graduated filter. So I didn't have one on me at the time, so I'm going to digitally use a graduated filter. Again, this is just another way of drawing a mask. So if we grab our linear grad over here, slightly different cursor tool again. Where I start drawing the mask is the strongest, and then when I finish drawing, so the line at the bottom, the mask is down to zero. So again, if I press M on the keyboard, like so, you can see the mask that we've created. So at this point, at the top line, it's 100%. In the middle, it's 50%. And by the last line, we're at 0%. And then it's symmetrical in between those lines. If I hover over the middle line, I can rotate and holding down shift will actually keep it horizontal. So now we could do a very similar thing. I could say, well, let's warm that up a touch. Uh, let's pull down the brightness and the highlights a bit. Let's add some clarity and so on. You get the idea. The disadvantage being here, of course, is that I'm also affecting the roof line, which I might not want. So it's very rare, you know, you get a perfect landscape where that gradient fits exactly. Now, next week, when we play around with luminosity masking, we can actually combine some of the, these masks with luminosity ranges as well to cut out the bits that we don't need. Um, you might think, well, actually, I could just erase this bit. So if I grab my eraser and then think, well, let's just erase this bit here, I'm going to get a warning that says, do you want to rasterize the mask? What does that mean? Well, the good thing about the linear gradient and radial, as you'll see, is that you can always infinitely change them. So if I'm looking at this and thinking, wow, my fall off is, you know, I really don't want that fall off so much. So you'll see here, as I play around with the mask, you can see the photo change in the background. So it's dynamic and, and I would think, you know, I want to lessen this fall off a little bit. So what I can do is if you hold down, oh, shift over this way a bit, Alt or Option, on your keyboard, click on the last line, and then we can squeeze that up, and that will make sure my fall off is no longer symmetrical, but asymmetrical. So the nice thing is about this linear gradient is that it's dynamic. As soon as I move my cursor back onto the picture, I can then start moving it around, playing with it, and so on. But as I said, if I wanted to erase a little bit, I get this weird message, do I want to rasterize the mask? So that basically means, do I want to lock the mask how it is? So right now, if I wanted to erase this bit, I'd have to right click and say rasterize. So now it really is no longer a linear gradient that I could go and edit. It's as if I'd brushed it in by hand myself. Oh, let's get rid of that. Uh, but now, if I wanted to erase a bit, then I could do so, like so. So that's what rasterizing does. It locks those dynamic masks to how they are at the current time. Okay, but to be honest, for this solution, Magic Brush works an absolute uh, treat. So that's linear. What about uh, radial? So let's go and look at, um, I think it's F1 fan Sebastian Vettel, maybe. So what about radials? <clears throat> so if we grab our radial mask icon over here, similar principle, slightly different icon once more, where I start drawing the mask, if you like, will burst out from that point. And I've got my mask turned on so you can see the kind of mask it's gonna create. It's essentially giving us a vignette around the edge. Similar principle to the linear, except now radial. Um, if I hover over the middle, I can rotate it. I can grab these handles to change uh, the shape. And I can also feather it or have it much harder, like so. So let's just get that in a more 
pleasing kind of shape like so. And what this means now is if I wanted to vignette this even more, it's kind of got a natural vignette, which is, is great. But if I wanted to vignette it even more, uh, then I could do so taking care not to block out my shadows too much, maybe reduce saturation down on the outside and so on. So it's just a very nice dynamic uh, vignette tool. Now, in some cases, uh, we might prefer the vignette to be on the inside. Probably this photo is a good um, example of that. So you've got a few ways of doing that. So if I press M again to show the mask, first thing we can do is force the outside line over the inside, like so. And now we've got our vignette on the middle. So if I wanted to brighten up Mr. Vettel a bit, then we could do something like that. Uh, and instead of going darker, I could brighten up his face a little bit, add a bit more contrast and so on. The other option is you can right click on any layer and you can say invert. So that would just make the masked areas not masked and the not masked areas masks, masked. So it would just flip it round like so. Um, one little word of warning, let's just invert that for a second. If you are using this as a vignette and you want to make you know, your vignettes darker, try to avoid using exposure because you might find that it will just make the shadows way too dark because exposure tool will make everything as dark, you know, dark on all the tones. Brightness tends to push the histogram to the left a bit with some protection on the shadows. So it's a little bit better if you want to darken down those outsides. Let's invert that back. Uh, let's say invert and then we stick to brightening Mr. Vettel like so. So radial vignettes, great. Now, the typical use, of course, for, uh, let's just get rid of that layer from whatever that layer is doing. Uh, the, the typical use of a linear tends to be for landscape, or that's what we think it's used for. Oh, linear gradient mask must be for landscape photographers. I don't need that. Not necessarily the case. You know, linear masking is great for all kinds of reasons. So we've got like a bright area in front of the race car which is maybe a bit distracting. Uh, so if we pull up our linear mask from the bottom, and I'm just gonna set it roughly on the bottom of the tires, hold my Alt key down to make the fall off asymmetric. And then now I can pull my brightness and the highlights down a bit and exposure. And then now we've got, if you like, a less distracting part at the front. By the way, all your base adjustments, as you might want to call it, these happen on the background layer. So anything on the background layer affects the entire picture. Anything in your adjustment layers, of course, are only going to affect uh, that particular adjustment. But linear um, masks, not just for photographers. All right, um, how are we doing for time? Good. So really that first part is just different ways of of drawing a mask. So we can do it by hand, we can use a magic brush, we can use radial and linear gradients. Um, the important factor to, to think about is the flow and opacity. So let's look at <clears throat> a couple of practical examples using style brushes. Because what style brushes do is essentially accelerate that whole um, process into one singular step, if you like. So if you're thinking it's a bit of work to be making layers and drawing masks and playing with flow and all that kind of stuff, is that a bit too much for, it, for me? It's not, but I also appreciate that it takes a little bit of time to get your head around it. Um, but we can accelerate that nicely by using something called style brushes, which really are just automating a lot of things that we just spoke about. So style brushes live here, just under the layers tool. Oh, before we do that, I forgot to check for questions. Um, mm, 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 mm. Jim was saying, can't you have used a negative brush on the gradient mask to remove unwanted section? Oh, yes, Jim, and we did that. So sorry, Jim, that was an older, older question. Um, <clears throat> let's have a look 
Um, Kevin said, when using the auto mask, which brush circle reads the area that the auto mask will be applied? Well, as I said, Kevin, I very rarely use the auto mask anymore because I find it not just a bit slow, really, when we've got all these other options. But if we do turn on auto mask, we get a third circle in the middle. And that basically samples, if you like, uh, the color or the density that we want to mask. So if I wanted to mask around the edge of this cap, <clears throat> excuse me, let's turn on the mask so we can see what we're doing, full flow. I would kind of brush here, and then when I let go, it will then find that edge. So you can see like so. So I have to keep the center circle where I want to sample. But I personally think that now we've got magic brush, luminosity masking, using the color editor, there's very few times when I actually want to need it. <clears throat> Uh, let's see, um, mm, mm, mm. layers are not available on Capture One Express, the free version Cindy was asking. Okay, so now we've got our guy here. <clears throat> I assume it's Richard on his jacket. <coughs> Excuse me, frog in my throat, won't go. Right, so first of all, we're just gonna do some basic editing. Uh, so let's reset this and see how it comes out of camera. So a little bit dingy, so let's bump up the exposure. Um, I'm conscious of the highlights being a bit bright here, so let's pull those down. And that's, you know, two simple edits, that's pretty, pretty solid. Um, but there's a couple of issues. First of all, it's a bit dark under the peak of his cap, like so. And I'd also like to make his cap a little bit redder as well. It's because the sun's hitting it, it looks a bit flat. So let's brighten up under the peak of his cap, like so. Just gonna clear my throat again, but mute so I don't bust anyone's eardrums. Let's try this as well. Hopefully that's got it, right. <laughs> um, so I wanna brighten up under here. So how will we do that thinking about what we did with the first shot, that landscape? Well, I could draw a mask, I could then dial in some adjustments, I could decide actually maybe my mask was a bit too harsh, I could drop the flow down, there'd be a lot of back and forth. Let's make that so much easier. So style brush is here, sitting under the layers tool. I'm looking under the light and contrast category. Uh, we'll look at enhancements a bit later on as well. So I want to open up the shadows, I would say. So I'm gonna click on shadows recover. Now, as soon as I click on that, my brush cursor tool is selected straight away, automatically. When I go onto the picture, or oh, let's turn off Kevin's auto mask. When I go onto the picture and right click, we can see that Capture One has actually adjusted the flow down to five, which fits this brush very well. Size and hardness will be whatever I last set it as, so it's up to you to decide how big the brush should be. The reason why we don't set size and hardness is that the size of the brush is based on photo resolution and we all have different resolution cameras so it's hard to get a default. So now all I need to do is start brushing and let's turn the mask off so you can see what's happening and we can open up the shadows under his hat. I'm going to go a bit far than I probably would like so. Now Capture One automatically made me a layer called Shadows Recover. And job's done. So that was super speedy. Now I probably went too far, now it doesn't look so natural. So let's pull down the opacity, that's no adjustment, that's maximum, so I'm gonna go somewhere around there, like so, simple. Any of you looking at that, if you didn't know I'd done this, wouldn't think I've done anything sneaky. So the mask isn't super, let's turn on the grayscale mask. The mask isn't like blindingly accurate or anything like that. It's roughly <coughs> in the right spot but it does the job, it looks natural. None of you would know that I'd done that. So I want to make the peak of the cap a bit redder. Now, I'm gonna use the magic brush for that, so let's zoom in. Now I need to make a new layer before we do this, because if I use the magic brush now on this layer, it's gonna mess up my mask. Because remember, the magic brush can add to any existing masking that you've done, whether that's a magic brush or one you've drawn yourself. So let's make a new layer and we're gonna call that cap, like so. So I grab my magic brush, go over to the hat. I'm gonna make that a bit bigger. Tolerance, 
I think we're probably fairly safe that it's not gonna spill into the background, but let's see. Uh, mask is on. Do a little squiggle here. Pretty good, I think there's a tiny missing bit here up in the corner, so let's fill that in. And there we go, mask on the cap, nicely done. So to make that look a bit richer, I'm just gonna darken it slightly and let's bump up the saturation, maybe a bit darker still, like so. Again, none of you would realize that I've messed around with this hat with a layer or anything like that. Again, the goal is for it to look nice and natural. Do we wanna do a vignette? Maybe, let's try it. So let's make another layer, grab my radial mask, draw burst out from the middle, let's make it nice and soft. Um, as the photo is kind of going in this direction, I'm gonna mimic that with the radial as well. And then pull the brightness down a touch too. Now if I wanna move this around and see what it does, you see I can do. So let's plop it about there, perfect. <clears throat> Again, you can turn your layers on and off just by ticking the box, that works really nicely. Uh, if we look at before and after, so that's no edits, and then after what we've done. Nothing, you know, groundbreaking there, but just a few simple things can really, you know, make a big, big difference, um, and quickly as well. So style brushes are not an amateur thing. It's just, if you like, um, automating a lot of those processes. If you want to do it manually, fair play to you. Uh, but a lot of the time it's not necessary unless you're building an adjustment on a layer which is super critical and we might do some of that next week style brushes work really really well okay what other examples can we look at let's take this gentleman down here as another example um, and look at two common things which is dodge and burn dodge and burn simply means make some areas darker make some areas brighter so on the previous photo, we did a shadow recovery. Sometimes if you just want to brighten or darken the overall tones, it makes more sense to use um, brighten, sorry, dodge and burn. Okay, uh, let's go and grab our dodge. So that's brighten. So straight away again, Capture One picks out the uh, brush cursor tool, like so. Go onto the picture, right click. We can see that our flow is set nice and low for this as well. Uh, let's make this a bit smaller. And then I just wanna brighten up you know, this area where it's just dropped into shadow and maybe a little bit on his sunglasses ever so slightly, but not much, just a relatively small touch. And if I wanted to burn, which is to darken, choose this style brush back onto my photo. Right click, I'm gonna make this nice and bigger and then I'm just gonna almost make a custom vignette and just darken over this side a bit. Again, if I've gone a bit too far, whoops, you know, that's too much brushing. I can either pull back the opacity and get it into something nice, or I can switch to my eraser and then just take out the bit that I didn't like. While we mention that, so notice how big my brush is here on this layer, my burn layer, so let's just wipe in a bit down the bottom here as well. So if I right click, we've got two really important check boxes here in the brush settings tool. First is brush with layer. So that means save the brush settings on a per layer basis. So notice how big the brush is now. If I go to dodge, now it goes smaller because that's how it was last set for that particular layer. Also, as I showed you before, if I switch to my eraser on this layer, notice how the brush looks exactly the same and it has all the same dynamics because the second checkbox links, if you like, the eraser and the brush together. So if I'm going back and forth a little bit, doing some brushing, doing some erasing, then those two will be linked. So if we wanted to just cut down uh, the side of his face here a little, so if I make my brush smaller and then I just darken that down slightly, if I feel, oh, perhaps, oh, that's not brush, that's a razor. So if I darken this down a little bit, and then if I suddenly decide, oh, I've gone a bit too far, all I need to do is hit E on my keyboard, changes to eraser, and then I can take a bit more away. So that just means flip flopping between the brushes is much, much simpler. 
All we need to do is look at a couple of shortcuts in a minute, but we'll look at just another category because we've only looked at light and contrast if we look at enhancements. So let's grab uh, add detail as an example. So again, I've got my add detail brush. Uh, let's make that a bit smaller. And then what add detail will do if I just start brushing, you see we've created our add detail layer. And if I just brush around those sharp areas, that will enhance that a bit more. So just helping it jump out. Now, none of what the style brushes are doing is a mystery. So you can see if I look at um, add detail, it's adding some clarity and structure like so. So if I zoom in a bit more, like 200%, and if I turn off add detail, you can see before and after. And again, if it's too heavy, we can just nicely dial back the opacity a bit rather than going back and erasing or playing with the adjustments just use uh, the opacity also under here we've got some color enhancements like uh, balancing you know warming up parts cooling down parts that's great or just pumping in some saturation in places um, or taking it away as well saturation minus is actually really handy if you've got a background and there's like a big obvious garish color somewhere then knocking the saturation out of that can be super useful. Uh, there was a question from how could you add the alpha cross onto the cap in the cap mask? Um, let's have a look. So, oh yeah, because that's a bit flat, isn't it? So if we choose our cap layer, grab our magic brush. Let's just zoom in a bit. Uh, I'm going to make that smaller <clears throat> and let's just do a little squiggle in the middle. There you go. So it's filled that in nicely. Little squiggle here and away you go. So easy, simple, simple. Actually worked really nicely. So you can see the mask there where it popped in. And that's, um, oops, filled that area in just nicely. So don't forget your magic brush can be additive like that as well. By default, the magic brush will stop when it hits or finds an edge, which is out of range of the tolerance. So if you think of, like I, if I poured a liquid in here, it gets blocked by those barriers, like so. What you can do is also say, sample the entire photo. So if I squiggled here again, then anything within the tolerance range on the entire picture would get picked out. So if I, it would probably pick out his shirt or something like that. Um, so we could try that. Um, or if I did his, probably not the best example. Let's look at something. Yeah, let's take Sebastian again. So if I just make a new layer, right click and we say sample entire photo. So if I do a bit here on the cap, you see it's also picked up his jacket as well because it's within the tolerance range like so. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, Jesse, exactly. So it knows to add it to that mask if that mask is selected. Yeah, and that's that can trip you up sometimes. So if I was on, I don't know, Shadows Recover, and I'd done that on the cross, then it would have taken the adjustments on that particular layer. So it's important, you know, if you're adding to that layer, of course, is to make sure you've got the right layer selected. But if you do make a mistake, uh, you can also just say undo like so if you realize, oh, that's on the wrong layer, and then all of a sudden your adjustments change, uh, then just do a, a quick undo. Okay, last thing that we're just gonna mention is um, a couple of shortcuts. So what you've seen me do, um, let's just go back here for a, a second, is right click, sorry, let's get the brush up. Right click to get up um, the brush settings, which is fine. And I'd recommend doing that at first because this way you'll have a good understanding of what's going on here. You won't have forgotten that. Maybe I've set flow at a completely wacky amount or something like that. You can see the tick boxes and so on. But as you get more confident, there's a really handy shortcut that you can use. So if we get overhead cam on, so you can see my brush down here. So if you hold down, see my hand over here, uh, control option, like so, and you can't see my tablet because it's just out of picture range, but if we hold down control option and then drag left or right, 
that will change the size and you get a little heads up display. So I'm just literally doing this left and right on the, the Wacom. So left and right like so as a shortcut. If I go up and down, that will change the hardness. And it's the same for a trackpad. So if I switch to the trackpad, which you can't see, and then click left and right, you can see it changes the size. If I go up and down, then we've got the hardness like so. If I do spider fingers, shift control option, PC users are mentioned in a second, and do the same thing. Then we get um, flow if I drag up and down and opacity if we go left and right, like so. I don't tend to use that as much, but adjusting the size is, is really handy in that shortcut. And especially when we get on to look at uh, healing and cloning next week, if you're spot busting, um, Sebastian has pretty good skin, but if we're doing like, uh, you know, dust busting or whatever, then it does make sense to be able to quickly change the uh, size of the brush without having to right click. But we're gonna look at healing and cloning uh, next week as well. Last few questions and I'll let you get uh, on your way. Um, is it worth purchasing a pen tablet compared to using a mouse? I would say yes, uh, but I would also say you don't have to spend a whole bunch of money. So this one is, uh, if I just put it under the camera, a rather beaten up now, uh, what is it, a Intuos Pro medium size, which is great, uh, but they are quite expensive. And if you are illustrating or into Photoshop or, or whatever, then I think it's, oh, I switched a picture on a keyboard shortcut by whacking it with the tablet, how clever. Um, if you're into illustration, I think having a big tablet is good. Uh, if you are using it photography, I don't think the real estate makes much sense because you're just having to make bigger arm movements. But what I like about using a tablet is that you're more, you're, you know, when you're masking, it tends to be, you're making nice soft brush strokes and so on. So I just find it easier than clicking with a mouse, if you like, but it's personal preference. But you don't have to spend a load of money. Wacom do a couple of really nice uh, base layer or if you like a base layer, I'm stuck on layers mode, base model uh, called the Wacom One, difficult name for marketing, uh, which works really great. Um, Juan, sorry, I forgot PC users for this. So what you need to do for the PC users, if you're on a mouse and it's the same for Photoshop, same buttons, control and alt will be for you, but you need to right click and drag, not left click, right click, and then to do opacity and flow, shift, control, alt, uh, and right click up and down, left and right. It's the same as Photoshop, but the difference between Mac and PC, for some reason on the PC, you can't do it with the left click, has to be a right click. Don't ask me why, but that, that's how it is. Um, let's look at a few questions. Um, Emilio, yep, that's a Wacom, like so. Um, the keyboard somebody was asking, I saw earlier, uh, it's um, a Logitech MX keys. I'm not on commission, um, it's a really nice keyboard, I have to say. Uh, I did start with the Apple Magic keyboard as well, but I prefer a bit more um, indent on the key press, if you like, a bit more of a positive feedback. I mean, the Apple keyboard looks nicer, um, it's a bit more comfortable to use and so on. Uh, better battery life, definitely. But the MX works uh, super nice. Okay. Um, Alan says, is there a Capture One textbook in English that details how to use all of the features? Yes, if you go to support.captureone.com, there's tons of articles there on uh, any of the features in Capture One. So support.captureone.com and you can search up anything as well. So that's where I would recommend you would go. Uh, Brian says, when would it be a good time to use the add detail brush versus structure? Well, structure is going to happen over the entire picture. So as we've got um, Chris's nice picture up here, if I was to add, you know, structure, that's going to happen over the whole shot. Now, depending how sharp this shot is, pretty damn sharp, um, I probably wouldn't want to add structure on 
the person at the front, but I might like to add a bit of structure on the mountain, so that would kind of make sense to add a bit of detail here, or vice versa. If we wanted some structure down in the rock face, I would brush that in as opposed to blanket applying it everywhere, because structure can be a bit destructive if uh, you're not careful. Steve says, with several layers, does the order you create them make a difference? No, with a tiny caveat. Uh, next week, when we talk about luminosity masking, again, it doesn't matter which order you make them in, uh, but if you start to do some healing and cloning with the luminosity layer in there, sometimes you need to recalculate it, otherwise you get ghosting. But we can mention that uh, next week as well. Um, so Steve, we answered your question. How would you sharpen the logo on his shirt? Uh, well, one thing to remember, if something isn't sharp in the first place, there's nothing much you can do. Like that is, you know, it's out of focus. So there's nothing I could do to that which will improve it or make it look photographically better. But if it was in focus, I mean the picture is in focus, it's just falling out of depth of field. Uh, but the alpha logo, we might be able to. So if we just grab uh, add detail, make that a bit bigger, uh, and then start brushing like so a little bit. If we turn that on and off, you can see before and after. It's almost falling out of focus as well. But something like that would work nicely. Uh, but the same principle with using, you know, add detail here. That's just a really great style brush that, that works everywhere. Uh, let's see, uh, could you anti-sharpen a part of an image? You could, you could just use negative clarity. One thing we didn't discuss was making your own style brushes, but you can save a style brush as well. You just need to set up the brush on the layer how you like and say save style brush and that's it. So you could, you know, make a new layer, do some negative clarity, a little bit of turn the sharpening off, negative structure, and then that could take some um, sharpness out of that as well. And the last thing that I'll finish on, a lot of the stuff today was all done with a mouse and a pen and so on but you do have a lot of shortcuts that you can add. So if we go to edit, edit keyboard shortcuts and look under the layers category, you can shortcut pretty much all of those things you saw, adding layers, deleting layers, um, inverting the mask, just go nuts with shortcuts. Uh, you can even set shortcuts for moving up and down the layer stack, going to the background with a shortcut and so on. So lots of different ways to speed up the workflow as well. So next week we shall look at a um, couple of more sophisticated things like luminosity masking, creating a mask with a color editor, healing and cloning, and there's a few other ways to modify masks like uh, feathering, refining, which is a super awesome feature as, as well. But you can accomplish a lot with the tools we spoke about so magic brush, drawing a mask, linear, radial. If you stop there and you don't turn up next week, that's fine. Um, and you'll instantly make all of the tools much more flexible in Capture One. That's also the goal. One last thing, if you are not a subscriber of our channel, if you could buy hidden subscribe, and also more importantly, the little bell next to it, because that means you get a notification when we go live as well. So if you're not subscribed, that would be a huge favor to me if you can uh, do so as well. Otherwise, we shall see you next week, hopefully. So enjoy the rest of your week. I hope that was useful. If we didn't get to your question, do apologize, but it was a busy one. So take care and enjoy working with layers. See you soon. Bye now.